for staying till the end is <laughs> the fun bit. This is, this is knocking the bad guys. You've heard that we're hardwired for addiction or for misuse of substances, and so the problem must be with the product. And who purveys the product uh, but industry? So commercialization of addictive products and to kick us off from Stirling University, got here in the nick of time through thick and thin, through Scottish snow, <laughs> Martin Stead, Marketing Ploys and Practices. Thank you, Thank you. and my apologies for not arriving until now. I was delayed by this much snow in Edinburgh, which has <laughs> mean, meant my straightforward journey it took 12 and a half hours. So I'm sorry I've missed everything else. Um, I'm sure it's been a really good day so far. I'm going to talk about a programme of work we've been doing in Alice Rapp Area 4, concerned with business and suppliers. And the focus of our work was on marketing and the role it plays in encouraging and sustaining addictive behaviours. And the t work was done by a team at Sterling, myself and colleagues, um, and a lot of other Alice Rapp collaborators, some of whom are here today. Um, from the UK, Italy, and the Netherlands. Um, so first of all, very quickly, what we meant by marketing in our work, not just advertising, we were concerned with marketing in its very widest sense, everything from product development and design, packaging, branding, how products are distributed and made available, point of sale, pricing, and so on. So we were talking about marketing in its widest sense, and not as it's sometimes talked about in research and policy, which tends to focus just on communications. So our work in Alice Rapp involves a programme of work, evidence reviews, um, what we call a realist review, which is not so much about trying to say whether there's evidence that X causes Y, but trying to unpack how X causes Y, what are the mechanisms, what are the pathways, what are the things that explain how effects are brought about. So we did three things. We first of all reviewed and summarised evidence of marketing's effect at all stages of addiction. Not just initiation, which has tended to be the focus of a lot of work. It's tended to focus on uptake among young people. But we're interested in how marketing also influences those who are already using substances. As I've said, we're interested in the mechanisms and pathways which might explain how marketing works. And then to identify the marketing strategies and practices which, if you like, activate those mechanisms. So first of all, I'll just very quickly summarise the evidence of marketing effects work. And I've just broken this up into young people and adults. Um, we know there's strong and consistent evidence from longitudinal as well as cross-sectional studies that young people are more likely to take up smoking, drinking, and also to eat less healthily as a result of exposure to advertising. Uh, food wasn't a focus of our Alice Rat work, but I included it here because there's a lot of work on uh, effects of advertising for food, effects of marketing for food, and it shows the same thing. So there's a consistent pattern across a whole range of consumption behaviours. Um, there's quite strong evidence base around point of sale displays on tobacco, and that's underpinned legislation in several countries, the UK included, to cover up tobacco displays at point of sale. And the effect of marketing on behaviour occurs when we control for other variables which we know influence uptake. So marketing exerts an influence independently. There's also strong evidence that ease of access contributes to likelihood of use among young people and indeed among adults as well. In terms of adults, it's been less extensively studied perhaps than marketing and young people, but there's strong evidence of a relationship with price, as everyone in this room will be very familiar with, lower price, higher uh, consumption and vice versa. There's fairly strong evidence, although it's a bit more complex, that consumption increase, increases with greater availability, so longer opening hours, a higher number or stronger density of retail outlets, and you find that evidence in tobacco, alcohol and gambling. There's also emerging evidence that people who are already using um, substances or engaging in gambling 
report feeling influenced by their day-to-day -day exposure to marketing cues such as price promotions, communications, simply seeing products in shops. They talk about this triggering cravings, triggering impulse purchases. And I'm sure it's already been discussed today, and I think Jan is going to discuss it um, in the next presentation, that there's emerging evidence around exposure to marketing cues, which Jan will speak about at more length. So that's the evidence um, of whether there is an effect of marketing on behaviour. Turning to our possible explanatory mechanisms, um, we looked at a number of theories, a number of sources of evidence, consumer behaviour literature, addiction literature, marketing literature. And from these we identified what we considered three overarching mechanisms which we've summed up in the, word, in the name Oscar um, to accompany Alice. Um, and we, <laughs> so Alice's friend Oscar. Um, so we've, we've called this Oscar, um, and it represents three overarching mechanisms or concepts. The first one being opportunity. So marketing creates and facilitates opportunity for consumption by making products available, affordable, uh, easy to use, and ubiquitous. Social cognitions, the S and C of our Oscar. We know that marketing. Um, elicits and shapes social cognitive responses such as positive emotions, affective responses, identification, expectancies, perceived benefits, and normative perceptions around how common, how widespread a behaviour is, and also how socially acceptable and desirable. And thirdly, automatic responses. Marketing exerts a lot of its power through what can be termed automatic responses. Responses which are largely unthinking, um, habitual, don't involve a lot of cognitive effort. They may be habitual, they may be impulsive, prompted by external cues and drawing on conditioned associations. And this tries to sum up how, how these mechanisms mediate between marketing strategies and behaviours. On the right hand side we have behaviours moving from initiation regular use, heavy use, cessation and relapse. And the evidence suggests that these mechanisms um, work to influence behaviour across this spectrum of behaviour, although it, it, there tends to be stronger evidence for some mechanisms at some stages. So the kind of social cognitive um, mechanisms to do with emotions, norms, identification and so on appear to be more important at the initiation and regular use stage, although they still have some importance um, when you get into heavier use. Automatic responses tend to be more important once people have developed patterns of use and are particularly important in terms of sustaining heavy use and making it hard to break out of heavy use. And opportunity exerts an influence across the whole spectrum. It facilitates initial initiation into substance use and it sustains heavy use and it makes it difficult to step back from use. So just to illustrate in a little more detail, um, looking first of all at opportunity, if we look at the text on the right, the black text, um, we know from various sources of evidence that outlet density is associated with increased use and harm that accessibility and proximity facilitate initial use and progression to regular use, that affordability is strongly related to consumption, and that easy opportunities to purchase and consume products are a constant temptation which can undermine efforts to quit. And if we look at the text on the left, on the right, in, in red rather, so these are some of the marketing strategies and practices which create and facilitate this opportunity. So you have selection and management of distribution channels, um, you have tobacco and alcohol, and increasingly some gambling products as well, distributed through the same channels as convenience goods like newspapers and groceries. You have a, with a, we have evidence of clustering in target neighbourhoods, such as low-income neighbourhoods and neighbourhoods with particular ethnicity, where a company is wanting to target a group, a particular target group, um, with a particular brand or product. Um, we have a lot of evidence of how retailer relationships are managed to ensure that products are displayed to optimum effect, um, made constantly available, 
um, displayed to, to um, make them as attractive as possible to trigger impulse purchases and so on. Through, on, through digital technology, of course, we have 24-7 access, particularly to gambling products, which can be accessed anywhere and at any time. And of course, pricing um, is also is a key part of creating and facilitating opportunity. In terms of social cognitions, if we look at the text on the right, again, the black text, um, we know this is an important mechanism explaining how marketing works because of evidence that shows that emotional responses such as liking or engaging with m marketing and promotions is predictive of uptake. There's evidence to show that advertising effects are mediated by positive expectations and norms. And there's evidence around having positive images and identification with smokers and drinkers that that increases the likelihood of use. And if we look at the red on the left, again, some of the marketing strategies and practices which elicit and shape these social cognitive responses. One of the most powerful is branding, one of the most powerful marketing tools, which is primarily a means of creating emotional connections between consumers and products. Branding is something that happens in consumers' heads if you like, to, to create a relationship with the product. We know that communications portray attractive images of users. They also model use. They, they show people how to consume products, how to, how to gamble, how to learn how to gamble. They normalize consumption. And we know that consum cons customer research is used extensively by marketers to identify target segments and desired benefits and to craft more motivating appeals. Turning to our automatic responses, um, as Jan will talk about later, I'm sure, we know that consumption habits are learned, conditioned as a result of rewards obtained and reinforced. And that this is, these effects are reinforced by associations and with environmental and sensory cues and there's evidence about cue reac reactivity and craving being triggered by exposure to cues. Um, relevant here as well is the concept of nudges, um, the idea that our behavior can be shaped by modifications in the environment of which we have little awareness, such as the, where products are placed in stores can make some more immediately accessible to us and available to us. Another relevant concept here is heuristics, the idea of mental shortcuts in our thinking. Um, and branding draws very strongly on this. Branding is itself a mental heuristic, which captures um, the essence of a brand in that logo, in, in, that, in that word. It does a lot of kind of cognitive work for us, if you like. So again, so marketing strategies that are relevant here product displays, um, strategies for triggering impulse purchases, um, strategies for encouraging in-play gambling. So during, during a match being broadcast, for example, there are uh, marketing devices which encourage people to place bets as they're watching the game. Things like color, sensory features, and so on. Another important type of marketing strategy here is strategies which lock people into habitual patterns of behavior. Okay. Um, things like rewards and loyalty schemes are a particular potent example of that, which um, rely on inertia to um, keep people in patterns of consumption. Very quickly, um, we know that um, stronger controls on marketing produce public health gains. Comprehensive controls on tobacco marketing have been associated with declines in prevalence and increases in quitting. And we also know the reverse, that when controls on marketing are relaxed, that we see increases, um, particularly in alcohol consumption and gambling. What do we still need to know about marketing and addiction? I think we need to know more about how marketing encourages progression and particularly how it affects heavy users. It's just not plausible that marketing only influences young people and only influences uptake. Most marketing is aimed at adults. It must influence them. We need to keep pace with technological and other developments in marketing practices. Um, an area we need more, more understanding of in particular is around sponsorship and celebrity endorsement. 
Very quickly, some policy recommendations from this area of work. In its widest sense, we need to be looking at how we can reduce exposure to marketing, not just advertising, but how products are distributed, displayed, made available and priced. We don't just need to be looking at the content of marketing, but the overall amount of it. Um, we, if for, in alcohol, for example, we have voluntary codes on what message appeals can be used, but we don't have controls on the overall amount, and it's the cumulative, saturative effect of marketing that makes it so powerful. Voluntary codes don't work. We need statutory regulation, like the Loi Vain in France. And our regulatory bodies should be truly independent and have strong powers. And the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control um, provides us with a model which we could adopt in alcohol and gambling demonstration of what we can achieve when countries work together in a concerted and comprehensive way. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Very, very concise, very comprehensive. Um, talking of the clustering made me think whether the sectors get together at all. If you watch a soccer match on Sky, there's an alcohol advert at halftime, followed by a gambling advert, followed by a loan until payday mm -hmm. advert. There's a, there's a, there's a scary uh, sort of logic to the order in which these... Is there any evidence that, that the alcohol industry and gambling, for example, get together to plan yes, strategies? Yes, I, I can't think of them just now because my head's a bit muddled after yeah. a long day, but we have examples in, the, in our report, yes, yeah. of those kind of collaborations, yeah. definitely. Jürgen, and then Peter, and then Robin. I'm, my question is about the um, more restrictive use of marketing and advertisement. And uh, I'm coming off the WHO meeting on NCDs, etc. And uh, for the third time, basically, uh, the people have been looking for convincing evidence to model the effects of bans on advertisement. I mean, we, we know it should have an effect. We know that why would industry give out so much money without having an effect? So that is clear. The problem is the evidence, and you made it as, as it is evidence-based. The, tr uh, the larger economic modeling by Enber in, uh, in the US and others did not find a significant effect. It was 0.7. 0.07. The Cochrane review uh, was not that great. Uh, and the newer effects, uh, that's for alcohol now, uh, the, newer, the newer efforts of the bigger think tanks of econometricians also didn't find an effect on those countries. It is, of course, a very problematic way to do that because uh, were our bans done? Because if you see problems, you, you, you're more likely to have a ban. If you believe there's less problems, you lift the ban. So you have to somehow account for that in quite complicated models. But uh, where do you see the evidence for your slide? Are you talking about evidence on advertising bans specifically or on... I think, I think that's part of the problem. That's, I mean, marketing is like a balloon. You know, you squeeze one bit and another bit pops up. And... What we've seen in, in the UK is not just looking at tobacco, is not just advertising being banned, but progressively more and more other forms of tobacco marketing. And then you start to see a gradual decline. I think it flags up that just controlling one area of marketing is, is never going to be the, the whole answer. You have to take a comprehensive think, approach. But for alcohol, this is not the case. For alcohol, the beta effects for uh, controlling more than advertisement with marketing are not better than the ones for, uh, for advertising alone. The, the tobacco effects uh, fall in line with uh, a very progressive uh, movement of tobacco, stigmatization of tobacco smokers. So there's lots of tobacco policy measures which would point in the same direction and it's pretty hard to say it was the marketing ban because with the framework convention, which is great, a lot of different measures came in. So I'm still, and people like Dan Chisholm, we're still waiting 
for uh, good numbers to model that or, or, or regressions or anything or well, evidence which would say that. Well, if you, get, if you have evidence that advertising works and people are more likely to take up something with advertising, it isn't a big leap to say that stopping the advertising would, would stop that, would prevent I that. I would absolutely agree mm. with that. Just give me the number. <laughs> To what percent? <laughs> He's a numbers man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Peter, you give us a number. Where the evidence is robust is around junk food and kids. And it, it's, it follows an age gradient as well. So there's a, a, a big evidence base there. But if you and stop the advertising, the, the advertising consumption bans, goes down. Because in the U.S., they temporarily, the KidVid uh, hearings, they temporarily banned advertising on television of all mm. junk, food. food, sugary cereals and things yeah. for children and dem in, in a natural experiment. And the interesting debate in the U.S. is around the, uh, free, the freedom of right for commercial speech which means corporations in America get the same rights as human beings, uh, <laughs> the right to free speech. And so the, um, the debate right now is around the fact that they can, e the, they can even show developmental windows where the marketing, the kids don't understand, they, they take what they're hearing as truth as opposed mm. to understanding that this is something somebody's trying to manipulate Promoting. me with. Yeah. And so they, they've even been able to show age gradients. So that's where you, you can find some evidence here again. It's not necessarily adults, but kids I think are, and, and the reason you may not be seeing it in alcohol and tobacco is because the kids are a smaller market, the, the initiators, and they um, may very well be developmentally different from the younger ones that, where we yeah. do see effects for food. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. I, I'm just gonna make a comment on this and then my question. I mean, tobacco advertising got banned with a, much, with a very weak evidence. I mean, there wasn't an evidence base. So, I mean, you, 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 know, you can make an argument that if there was political will, alcohol advertising would be banned. You don't need the evidence base for that. My, my question, Martin, I mean, I really do like your Oscar model, thank you. Um, what, I just wondered why, I, I think there's a real opportunity also to follow that through to all the policy responses to be slightly more sophisticated, meaning the policy responses you ended up with were sort of these rather big major mm -hmm. policy responses, but maybe there's a lot of different levels mm -hmm. of things that one can also do that cumulatively would have an impact as Grouped well. Grouped around the mechanisms. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, thank you. I think if we'd think given you half that. an hour, you would have told us those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank if you. If I can follow no, up on that one. It. Yes, please. Um, actually, we did some experiments with evaluative conditioning, and that's exactly what people in the advertising uh, world use all the time. Yeah? So you pair a new product with something positive. You want to sell a sports car, so you put a nice-looking uh, woman on it, because mostly men buy these sports cars. And your sales goes up. So um, we did a couple of studies with alcohol where we paired it to negative pictures. And surprisingly, people drink less, and that's mm. an experimental study in the week after. So it's suggesting that you can not only ban advertising, but even do something like anti-advertising. So just ne you have to persuade mm. industry now to use negative <laughs> advertisements. I'm afraid an old, we have to an old, do an it. Old, yes, sorry, I won't go there. Robin. <laughs> um, the, the thing about Advertising is that I don't think we can view it only in terms of is it convincing someone tomorrow to buy a project. Essentially, the argument over advertising is an advertiser is an argument about what kind of society do you want to have and um, what is the place of that product in the society. And when they're buying, they're uh, spending their money on the promotion and the advertising. They're buying the um, the complacence of the uh, media, among other things, um, in in a presentation of the world, which you know then goes well beyond the advertising. So that I think that the argument, you know, the po policy argument about advertising is not only cannot only be solved by the question of what's the uh, immediate effects of imposing a ban, essentially. Um, uh, quite apart from all the other issues that you, you're raising, um, and it it really um, that. In the context of the EU, in the context of, the Euro, of Europe, essentially, there really are some important collective issues to be talked about. There are, uh, at this point, uh, international treaties being signed, you know, including by the European Union, 
That will make it much more difficult to um, control labeling, for instance, on, on products. Um, the, uh, you know, somehow or other, the European Union, even though it didn't have a public health um, competence at the time, managed to impose restrictions on uh, tobacco advertising in the name of the single market, a very odd thing that they managed to do. Uh, they managed to actually force state lotteries to behave a little more responsibly by saying that otherwise they would lose their right to be a, a, um, a monopoly. Um, so the EU is capable of acting even if it is supposed to be all about free market. Mm -hmm. But and, and the question is how can, uh, how can the... Um, uh, citizens of the European Union get it to behave a little bit more <laughs> with respect to all of the um, products we're talking about. <laughs> well, I think those, those of us who went to a meeting uh, about two weeks ago uh, in Leuven came to the conclusion that we're not doing very well in, in uh, changing the, the line of the European Union. I think that was a long comment rather than a question. <laughs> Could I just say something? Yes. I think there's a powerful framing around child protection around protecting children and it resonates to the very first thing you said about what sort of society do we want to live in and bring our children up in but i think as we're seeing more evidence coming out now that marketing um if affects people who are already heavy dependent Again. users and makes it more difficult for them to to quit or to adhere to treatments i think you could extend that argument also to a, a kind of rights and a protection argument for people who have Develop oh. dependency and are trying to um, okay. comply with treatment, and marketing is making it hard for them. We're going to have to move on in a second because we started a bit late and we don't want to finish late. But Patricia, were children mentioned there? Um, well, w one thing worth mentioning, and I think we'll talk about it tomorrow, is that um, advertising on the internet doesn't, you know, doesn't have this kind of protective approach towards children. So that's mm. that, that's maybe something that needs to be discussed in more mm, length tomorrow. Definitely. Um, I actually just, I loved your presentation. I think the Oscar model could even be presented to young people to get to give them a better mm, understanding a of Thank how you, it yeah. is that they are mm. being you know swayed mm. uh, or the public generally. But um, I I just have a question for you. So you know when the bans came in to effect, you noticed the effect on on television that you just you, you know people just weren't smoking on television or in in films anymore. But then I I think there was another uh, law, uh, you know, that was passed against it, where you could then portray smoking for creative reasons, right? That you know, if it fit the the, the plot, and then suddenly, we have television shows and movies and that are promoting smoking again, but without a brand connected to it. And my question is: to is there any evidence that that industry is behind that that um, new wave of like Mad Men and The Hour, and these, these shows and these ways in which heavy drinking and smoking are, have resurfaced in, in, uh, in okay. media. Do you, do you know the answer to that, Martine? I'm pretty sure there is. I, I, can't, I haven't I can't got think, it to hand. I can't think that industry wouldn't be behind it. But yeah, you, you certainly don't. with alcohol there is. And, and I would yeah. guess there is with smoking as well. Yeah. And certainly with alcohol, okay. yes. Fine. Thanks very much, Martine. Okay. We're going to move on, as I say, so we can finish uh, promptly. And Jan uh, Ramakis is going to talk about uh, advertising cues and effects on the brain. So thank you very much. Um, in my presentation, I will focus uh, on the individual, basically, on how the individual, or his brain, or her brain, responds to uh, exposure of marketing, marketing of alcohol, or marketing of drugs. And I want to talk about not just the marketing effect itself, but also how um, people respond to marketing when they're actually in the intoxicated uh, state. Uh, this is a uh, picture that I've always liked very much. Uh, so it dates back to 2008, and it basically shows why we like drinking alcohol so much. And if you look at the upper panel, you basically see an fMRI result of the effect of alcohol exposure, al alcohol intoxication, which here primarily uh, is active in the striatum. And the striatum, as we all know, is part of the reward system in the brain, which is a major player in uh, our uh, experiences of uh, pleasure. So alcohol uh, promotes uh, pleasure as well through the striatum. In the second panel, we're looking at uh, subjects who are watching fearful faces. 
So what, we, re, what is represented here is fear. And one of the uh, brain areas that's you know, lighted is the amygdala, which is part of our limbic emotional system. Now in the lower panel, we see the same subjects watching fearful faces, but now when intoxicated. And what we see is that there is no more, or even at least much less activation of the amygdala. So apart from um, producing pleasure, it's also a drug that reduces fear, and by that also inhibition. So this is, these are two qualities that we think recognize very well uh, for alcohol. Now, alcohol acts on the reward system. Uh, many drugs of abuse actually do, but they may do so via very different pharmacological mechanisms. But one thing they have actually in common, which is the sort of entrance to the reward system, which is throughout, through the striatum, the, and in particular the nucleus accumbens. And if you go back to animal studies that date way back to the 80s, we can see that drugs like amphetamine, cocaine, nicotine, morphine, or any drugs of abuse that you actually, actually can think about, increases one way or the other dopamine in the striatum. So this is a pretty uh, central concept in our understanding of the biological mechanisms that, uh, that underlie the, our experience of, uh, of drugs. Now, this reward pathway uh, includes the nucleus accumbens um, and other areas in the brain. And they are, all, they are not only activated by drugs, as we have also heard uh, before today, but they may also be activated by all sorts of activities that sort of induce pleasure, like eating chocolate or perhaps even sugar, as we heard. Uh, sports, like marathon running, can be addictive, some people say. Uh, love would be another uh, example, and food. So this is a sort of a common pathway that we uh, are able to localize that play a major role. Now, some years ago, it became evident that it is not just the drugs that activate this reward system, but it is also activated by being exposed to cues that are related to drug. So here is a study uh, from 2003 where we are looking at the brain response to the image of a glass of beer in comparison to the image of a glass of Coca-Cola. Now, and what you're looking at uh, in uh, the brain imaging picture here is this different score between you know, looking at, co at the Coca-Cola, uh, Coca looking at beer, relative uh, in a group of alcoholics versus controls. And here we see that the, the alcoholics actually respond much more sensitive, much more, they're much more active in their brain areas in the reward system than anybody who is not uh, uh, addicted to, uh, to alcohol. And this is also true for uh, cannabis users. So if you present um, uh, materials that people use to smoke their cannabis, then uh, these cues will also already activate the brain reward system. So if cues, drug-related cues, can actually activate the brain, then it's a little step to assume that you know, when you're watching marketing movies, perhaps the, step, the same would actually occur. And this is basically what we try to uh, establish in a study that we conducted as part of LSRAP, where we um, set up an experimental study that consisted of three groups. Uh, one group was uh, a group of regular alcohol users, so they drank at least 20 units of alcohol uh, every week. Uh, we had a group of cannabis users, so th these were regular smokers, like th three, four times in a week. And we had a group of controls, so they, were no, uh, they had no strong history, at least, of uh, drug or alcohol use. Now, the two treatment groups, they received either a placebo or they received a dose of alcohol that brought them to a blood alcohol concentration of 0.8. Right? So our legal limit is 0.5. 0.8 is relatively uh, high dose. And uh, the cannabis group received either a placebo or uh, a dose of 300 micrograms per of THC per kilogram body weight, which is about 30 milligrams. So we had an active dose and we had a placebo in these two groups. The, the control group obviously did not receive any uh, treatments uh, whatsoever. So um, we ex we uh, had these, so we, they, were, there was, they were administered, the drugs and the placebo, and after that administration, we actually put them in a, a, a brain scanner, 
this free Tesla machine that you see here. And while in the scanner, they were exposed to uh, marketing uh, movies. And I want to show you some of the marketing movies that we have been using in this experiment. There were a number of them that we uh, administered, but just to give you a hint of these. So this is the first one, uh, a beer commercial. If it's working. Since its birth in 1873, X has maintained the same recipe. We've only used the purest barley, malt, hops, yeast, and water. We don't follow fads, and we salute those who remain true to themselves. And even though our look may change, we guarantee our taste never will. That's a promise. That's pure Bex. So, who fancies a beer right now? And, uh, of course, there are no commercials for cannabis available, so we had to sort of pan them ourselves, and we, we sort of made them from instruction document, doc documentaries on, on cannabis. So The Dutch feel that works very well. It's not cannabis. <laughs> and finally, uh, we also needed a neutral movies, right, as a comparison for the alcohol movies and the cannabis movies. And here's an example of this. <laughs> Het grootste deel van je lichaam bestaat uit water. Je hebt twee liter water per dag nodig om je lichaam te zuiveren. Het is dus belangrijk dat je weet wat je drinkt. Zuiver water met mineralen in een goede verhouding. Barle Duc voldoet hieraan en kan onbeperkt gedronken worden. Water is van levensbelang voor je. Dus kies het beste. Barle Duc. So we, we had Dutch uh, subjects, so they understood it perfectly well. So, uh, moving on to the results, just uh, quickly. Um, if you look at the effects of uh, marketing exposure uh, per se, so this is basically the comparison of the, the treatment groups during their placebo treatment uh, relative to the control group who received no treatments whatsoever. You can see that uh, in the upper panel that there are you know, these red blobs in the brain. They are referring to activation uh, while looking at the marketing movies. And that means that the activation was bigger during the alcohol marketing movies relative to the neutral uh, uh, marketing movies, both in the alcohol groups, but also in the cannabis groups. And so many uh, areas in the brains were affected, particularly also the prefrontal cortex, uh, cortex areas, but also the striatum, as we would expect. So, so the marketing exposure data sort of replicates what we already knew uh, when looking at you know, drug cues and alcohol cues that are being presented to people. What was interesting is that this response sort of reversed when people were looking at these marketing movies while intoxicated. So in the intoxicated state of alcohol or, can or, or cannabis, there was a, a actually a reduction in the brain response to these marketing movies. And this is being depicted more clearly, I guess, in this slide. It's perhaps a little bit difficult to see. But what we're looking at here on the y-axis is the percentage of signal change in the striatum. And uh, we have two groups, the alcohol group, the cannabis group, and the controls. Now, the gray bars, they represent the alcohol marketing movies. And what you see is that in the alcohol group, there's a big increase in the brain response, right? And we actually see the same in the cannabis group, if you look at the gray bars. So the cannabis, the cannabis group also likes to drink uh, uh, alcohol, and they respond to alcohol advertisement. And the same is actually true for the control group which are just, you know, we could have been in the control group, right? We, are, we, we use alcohol every, every now and then. But if you look at the, uh, at the uh, 
if you look at the uh, placebo treatments and the alcohol treatments, if you compare them, you see that the gray bars actually decrease. So during alcohol intoxication, there is a lower response to the marketing moves in the alcohol group. And that is also true in the cannabis group, if you compare the two black bars with each other. So one is during the placebo, and one is during the cannabis intoxication itself. So this seems to indicate that, um, the, so what does it mean? That's basically the question. It could mean that perhaps people are already intoxicated and they no longer uh, have a need or a wanting for, uh, for the same substance while looking at the, the, the marketing movies. Uh, that would be one explanation. And another explanation could be that these drugs actually increase the tonic levels of, of dopamine in, in the striatum. And there is some uh, evidence in the literature that indicates that high levels of tonic dopamine actually protects against the um, activating effect of phasic stimuli. So marketing cues, they would actually increase or they would affect phasic dopaminergic responding in the brain. So what, 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 what can we learn uh, from this uh, particular study? Uh, well, clearly, it's obvious that, that marketing moves that can actually trigger the brain response, just as uh, drug use uh, can also do. So they trigger the same response that alcohol does when you drink it, and then trigger the same response uh, that cannabis does when you smoke it. And it's also clear that groups that are already using alcohol and high uh, frequencies or that are uh, high frequent users of cannabis, that they are more sensitive to these effects of marketing exposure than those people who are actually not regular users. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Well, no doubt the drinks industry will notice that it's not worth advertising their products late at night when the drinkers are already asleep in front of the television. So get the adverts in early if you want them to have an effect before people start drinking. Questions? Uh, Comments in that interesting study. I yes. Uh, just a matter of clarification. Uh, you just show the ad once, or with intoxicated uh, people, you have more than one ad to test the sensitivity to exposure in time. Yeah. Now we we had more than one ad. This is just one example. But I, we basically had blocks mm -hmm. of, uh, of advertisement. So one block in, in total would be like 10 minutes uh, of, 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 uh, of cannabis advertisements. So, and each, uh, each um, uh, video sort of lasts 30, 30 seconds. But we had a number of advertisements that basically triggered the same response. But I'll just show you one as an example. Thank you. Did, did you consider having a control group that, that took alcohol in other words, the non-drinkers non testing them after alcohol to see whether uh, they would be more influenced than the, the regular drinkers who just went to sleep after they had a drink and didn't bother with the advert. No, we, di we did not consider mm. it because mm. we were primarily interested in, 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 in heavy users uh, at, heavy at the users, time of okay. uh, designing the study. Fair enough. <laughs> well, provided they agreed, free, free drink. I have a question for clarification. How did you introduce the study to the, to the people, to the subjects? What, was there any cover story or did you say, what, what did you tell them? Um, we uh, basically told them the objective of the, of the study. That was absolutely clear. But at the same time, while looking at the movies, they did not really have to respond. Any, they didn't do anything, right? They didn't have to respond. Uh, what we did do is after watching a movie, we asked them to rate the attractiveness of the movie. That was basically what their task was while lying in the scanner. But otherwise, uh, I'm not sure exactly where, where you're going, but in terms of objective, people were clear about what the objective were. They were blind about the treatment conditions and other things. No, no, it did not use deception, no. In which way do you mean that? Placebo. Well, the placebo is a deception, but... Tony. If, if I get it right, the reaction uh, in front of alcohol was very similar between those who are regular drinkers 
and those who are usually uh, abstainers when, when they are not drinking. So, yes. Uh, would, you, would this have any implications? The, yeah, as I see it, this, these data actually show that the, 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 so the, the, the effect of marketing is as strong as in people who drink every day as, as in people who drink on occasions. But it also suggests, doesn't it, that heavy users who are trying to abstain will be susceptible to advertisements yes, while, uh, they're, while they're sober. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I must say, personally, I found the neutral advert quite exciting, but that, <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, and I think we've made up a bit of time. That's really useful. And now we've got um, David Miller telling us about the potency of producers. And this has got nothing to do with sex addiction, has it? Potency, no, no. The potency of producers. And in case you think I put the word potency in there, it wasn't me, okay? <laughs> right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, this is a talk about the research we did on the web of influence, as we call it, uh, which is essentially an EU-level study involving social network analysis of a series of different data on co corporate connections to policy-related organisations. We brought together three different databases, crunched them about in the database and used that to produce an analysis of the connections between the corporations from the four different industries we were looking at, uh, food, alcohol, tobacco and gambling, uh, and the other policy-related organisations with which they were uh, related in some way through membership or uh, uh, affiliation or some other kind of connection, uh, which usually involved money but not always. We compiled the data from various public sources and memberships, interlocks and affiliations, uh, um, and the, the list's there. And we sub supplemented that by um, political economy research, publication analysis, interviews, grey materials, leaked, and uh, freedom of information documents. So essentially we were doing something called power structure research, which has two elements, social network analysis on the one hand, and then content analysis of the views and activities of the uh, organisations and individuals in the network. And I'm going to show you just some of the stuff that we've found, uh, in, in particular try to give you an overall account of the, 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 the most important elements of the ways in which corporations network together. This is our total network. Uh, you'll see some more social network diagrams in a minute. Uh, the connections of, of the, to the big, biggest cluster there means that there are connections between in, individual organisations and other organisations. The bits that are disconnected, you can see floating over there are the ones that have no connections that we, that we could find, at least in the data, uh, to the bigger network. But that's, that, overall, that's the four or sets of uh, industries at the European level uh, linked together. And this is, it refi uh, so, and this is to, to, essentially to show that there are uh, links between corporations which are, are possible to find, which you wouldn't necessarily normally see uh, from just your normal investigations of a particular industry or corporation. The strategies... Um, that they plan uh, through these networks are not always successful, but they do do these things consciously. There are there is planning. So when someone asked Martine about whether the uh, industry in, had been involved in trying to make sure that it was, its products were more favourably shown in the media, well, of course that's happening. We don't necessarily know that, but uh, there are ways to find those things out, even if they try and keep those things secret sometimes. This is the network of policy connections one deep with the, with the four industries that we were interested in. You can see them there, the, the food industry, tobacco industry, uh, uh, alcohol and gambling. Um, so food, uh, sort of uh, mustard color, the alcohol is blue, uh, tobacco is a pale blue and gambling green. And you can see uh, from that um, how the, the organizations cluster together. Now what I've put also in there, which I, um, I should draw your attention to, you probably can't see very well from there, are the light blue uh, of think tanks, uh, uh, who are, which are quite central in the network, you can see, and also the red of the advertising and marketing industry, which is a thing we didn't look for and hadn't anticipated, but which is really central to the network, uh, which we found. And you can see the, the, the overall, the alcohol companies and trade associations dominate the network, the, the gambling sector is connected sparsely, mainly along the bottom there, gambling uh, organisations not connected to the main network. Food and alcohol are interconnected to each other, 
you can see there the, the mustard and the, the blue. Uh, the advertising industry bodies central, and in particular the one in the middle you can see, if you can see it, the red in the middle is the World Federation of Advertisers, the most central uh, advertising industry body in this network and really a very important actor as it turned out uh, in our research. Now, essentially what we're saying here is that, to show this another way, is that uh, corporations have multiple ways into policy. They have multiple voices. Uh, this is an, indicator, uh, an example from Diageo. Uh, we could have used others. These are not all of Diageo's connections into policy. They're just a range of them. Diageo uh, owns a number of uh, whisky distilleries in Scotland, giving it 17 memberships of the Scotch Whisky Association, which is active at the Scottish, UK, EU levels. Uh, it's also members of these uh, uh, trade associations, including Spirits Europe, and you can see there the World Federation of Advertisers again. Uh, the European Forum for Responsible Drinking, now defunct. And these are all, of course, members of the European Alcohol Health Forum. So Diageo has all those voices at the table, uh, although you wouldn't necessarily know, and of course other corporations do too. Then Diageo also funds uh, ICAP, uh, the International Centre on Alcohol Policies, the Weinberg Group and the European Policy Centre, and of course Weinberg itself also for funds the European Policy Centre. These are policy-related organisations we'll come back to all of which uh, help them to target the European Commission, along with more general corporate lobbying groups, uh, such as Business Europe, the most, the most important cross-business uh, EU lobbyists, AmCham EU, the most important American uh, lobby group, and BritCham. Here's um, uh, the Diageo Ego Network. You, you can see with, uh, again, the colours there, the uh, food, uh, medium PRs in red again, alcohol blue, showing you uh, Diageo in the middle there, and its connections. Too, this is only too deep, so uh, organisations connected to Diageo and then connected to uh, those organisations. But you can see already you have uh, the, the advertising industries in there, and also uh, the uh, food industry too, uh, along the, uh, the um, left as you're looking at it. The same could be done, the same kind of diagram could be done for Nestle. Here's uh, Nestle's involvement with lobby groups and think tanks, with lobby firms, with policy fora, and with a whole range of trade associations, and we could talk in particular about how they relate to those organisations, uh, in particular, uh, specifically in what they do in relation to those organisations, but these are a whole range of EU-level uh, um, voices that Nestle has. These are the ones which are, which are uh, openly acknowledged. Similarly for Coca-Cola, and you can see uh, their CSR activities, the Advertising Education Forum, which Nestle is also part of, the International Life Sciences Institute, the European Food and Drink Council, all important actors at the EU level, which these big companies are all uh, uh, interlocked with, along with their various other policy fora and trade associations. Or Philip Morris, very, very much more important uh, for Philip Morris to be members of trade associations, since it's, uh, uh, it's, its role as a policy actor is somewhat controversial, as you'll know. Uh, and also, of course, they have uh, involvement with um, lobby firms uh, and with uh, uh, lobby groups and think tanks. Uh, and you can do this for any number of the large corporations, showing that, that each of them has large numbers of corporate voices. Now, uh, what this tells us, um, we think, is that um, the multiple corporate voices are important for a variety of purposes, not just for one purpose. And the, the Perhaps the most important thing we've, we've found is that a lot of what the corporations are active in at the European level is, is not just about policy capture directly through lobbying or trade associations, but it's, it's also about this, the capture of civil society organisations which then are used uh, uh, to try and capture policy indirectly. And that's like a, a, a way of doing things which is, I suppose, is a little bit known, but it's not quite well conceptualised in the social sciences, the notion that civil society is something which is an ally of the corporations as opposed to an enemy, is not well known uh, in conceptual terms in the literature and civil society, for example. Now, I want to suggest that there are a number of ways in which this is done. First of all, through AstroTurf, that is fake grassroots groups, which are set up by or funded by or influenced by the corporations, uh, a specific category of organisations, and mostly these are, are, are secret uh, connections, covert connections to, uh, um, to groups, and they don't show up in our data uh, um, without us having done extra investigative work to find that out. But then also there are think tanks which do show up in the data. Uh, we've already mentioned some of them. 
There are CSR, corporate social responsibility activities, which the corporations are also involved in. There's science, the use of science in particular in policy processes. I don't just mean in terms of funding science, but the use of science and science policy groups in, in, uh, 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 in, in policy processes. And then the advertising, marketing and media industries, again, as I mentioned, much more important than we had anticipated. And all of these are used as a means to try and capture policy, uh, which is the ultimate objective, the, the only point of doing this. So the purpose of front groups and astroturf groups is to give the audience impression that business views are held by a, a large range of groups, or perhaps by uh, actual people. Uh, the, these groups require to be secretive and deceptive to work, and there's a long history of this, as we, I, guess, I guess we know, in uh, policy work at the European level, at the national level, in the US. Here's the European Science and Environment Forum, funded by the tobacco and the chemical industries for some time. Uh, the European Instantiation of the uh, Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, set up by Philip Morris uh, in the US. And there are, of course, well-known examples of, uh, of uh, patient groups being set up by drugs firms to try and advance their interests. Or um, uh, one of the ones I, examples I always use, the Obesity Awareness and uh, Solutions Trust, which once was it, which we exposed some years ago and which uh, promptly became toast as a result. Uh, think tanks and policy planning. This is us back onto the to the kind of more open end of the world of the the world, and you can see that the blue. Uh, light blue there are the think tanks uh, central to the to the network. Um, they are central to EU lobby networks. They they have deceptive and covert relations with corporations, although sometimes we know about some of those. And here's the, the network um, displayed um, more uh, in a larger fashion. You can see the one in the very centre there, the light blue one with the red circle around it, is the most central and most important think tank in relation to addiction issues. And it's the European Policy Centre has the most important connections. But there are a whole range of other think tanks uh, which we'll talk about uh, in a second, all of which are quite central. You can see that the, the diagram there has, has shown that they are quite central to the network, not on the periphery, like some of the tobacco industry uh, organisations here down the bottom, the brown there, which is tobacco. Or uh, they're, they're quite central to uh, link together many of the industry uh, organisations. So there's the EPC, the most central, most important think tank in relation to this question, the question of addictions which has been a, a covert lobbyist for Big Tobacco, as the tobacco documents have shown, but also works uh, for the food and the alcohol industries and, and others, uh, um, uh, cre creating uh, what appear to be neutral and independent fora, but actually are there to pursue the interests of those industries. There's the Kangaroo Group, which is a key uh, organisation for the tobacco industry. doesn't really have much connection with food or alcohol, but is a mechanism for uh, the tobacco industry to to um, access the European Parliament in particular. Uh, the, and it's ICAP, the collective think tank for big alcohol. Three minutes, wow. <laughs> uh, and uh, which you'll know about. And then there's uh, uh, other, other ones, the, the European Centre for Public Affairs, Friends of Europe, quite central to corporate lobbying in general, but also, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, connected to, in particular, to uh, food and alcohol industries. Uh, none of these uh, organisations are, pr are properly transparent about their activities, uh, and uh, I would suggest they need to be. Corporate social responsibility. This is another mechanism for the corporations to get close to policymakers. Uh, to, to the, the history of this is that there was a multi-stakeholder forum which founded on a dispute about the voluntary nature of corporate social responsibility, which is the fundamental nature of CSR for the corporations. Uh, uh, the voluntary measures were rejected by the civil society platform, meaning the real civil society organisations, uh, and the, the, the corporation set up the European Alliance for CSR, which has these functions according to its website, the most important one being the top one, which is high-level discussions and dialogue with the European Commission, and that's the function of CSR. And all the uh, um, industries, uh, in particular the alcohol industry, uh, are involved in um, lots of corporate social responsibility activities uh, in order to pursue their policies. Drink Aware, created by the Portman Group, uh, the Association for Advancing Alcohol Responsibility, created by the Century Council, uh, and ICAP in 2015, changing its name to the International Association for Responsible Drinking. Quite a, a, a big investment there by the alcohol industry in, in apparent uh, responsibility. The same with the gambling industry, with the creation of Gamble Aware uh, in the UK. And uh, so there's a 
our view on this, is that, as, as with many of the other issues we're facing, is there's a strong need to move beyond voluntary approaches. If corporations are going to be responsible, then they need to be responsible, not to pretend that they might be responsible and to, to monitor that themselves. It needs to be uh, pro pro a proper responsibility, which is binding on them. The science organisations, just to go through this, this um, quickly, the, the thing which is interesting about these organisations is that they're, they're not there to really to, to compromise science, although they do do that. But the, 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 one, the really important uh, aspect of LC and UFIC, and also of IFIC, his international cousin, is that they are there to try and, it seems to me, contaminate the flow of experts being used or be potentially accessed by the European Commission or by European expert committees. And you can see that, that, that they're strongly involved in, in a whole range of different policy areas and, and linked to the, the different industries, in particular, in this case, to the food industry. And if you look then at the, how that uh, operates in terms of conflicts of interest, you see that the organisations like EFSA, uh, the European Food Safety Authority, have high, very high levels of conflicts of interest, and in particular uh, um, uh, of conflicts of interest with people who've got connections with LC and UFIC, uh, who, who uh, um, are, have been involved with them. Uh, uh, over the years. The marketing and advertising uh, industries uh, as public health challenges is one of the things we, we, we you know, conclusion is that it's not just that we need to examine the vectors of disease as it were but that or maybe dif differently that the marketing and advertising industry is itself one of the vectors of disease. It's very strongly uh, uh, interconnected with uh, alcohol and food uh, industries uh, and here's just some examples of that, the way in which they are closely aligned the close working relationships to defend commercial communications against regulation, which uh, Martine has been talking about. Here's the members of the World Federation of Advertising, some of them. Uh, you can see that amongst them are addictive industries, or uh, industries involved in food, Coca-Cola, Carlsberg, Diageo, etc. Uh, and they are closely involved in, uh, in discussions about the possibility of regulating marketing or advertising promotions, etc. And, it's, and they, they're making significant investment in, uh, uh, in academics to attack public health messages. So they, we hire academics to produce research which says that Martin's research is wrong and there's no impact of advertising and marketing. And they also are involved with a whole series of policy groups at the, U the UK and at other national levels and at the EU level, such as the EU Pledge, the Responsible Advertising and Children Campaign, and the Advertising Education Forum, Media Smart, which is there to, to help children to learn how to defend themselves against uh, advertising, or rather not to do that. Uh, and these are all organised by and run by the advertising industry, and many of them actually run out of uh, Brussels out by uh, Landmark, the PR, uh, the lobbying firm uh, in Brussels, and I'll come back to EU Pledge in a minute. Uh, partnership governance, um, same kind of issue here with, with voluntary CSR. This is a voluntary approach to governance. It's not about uh, requiring corporations to uh, undertake um, positive changes, and it, and it enshrines voluntary approaches to compliance, whereby uh, pledges are made by the corporations and people who monitor to see if they're, they've made, met those pledges are the corporations and they don't even have to meet them in any case uh, re regardless of uh, what they actually find that they've done and that's particularly the case with uh, the EU platform on diet, physical activity and health, binding regulation needed not co-regulation. Uh, let's miss out this revolving door slide and the ongoing issues at the European Food uh, Safety Standards Agency including the revolving door, the conflicts of interest with ILSI and uh, UFIC, the inadequate mechanisms for gathering, monitoring and managing conflicts, and then the, 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 the thing, this response that the Commission is making. There are new regulations, there's new transparency regulations, but they are, they are not enough yet, and they need to be monitored much more effectively than they currently are. And uh, that's in particular in relation to the Transparency Register, launched in 2011, voluntary, uh, incomplete and inconsistent, uh, subverted by, for example, Philip Morris. Leaked documents showed that they hadn't properly reported what they were doing. Uh, and then here's the example of the of ILSI, uh, the International Life Sciences Institute. Here's all its members. It doesn't register with the Transparency reg Register at all. Three, four of its members do register uh, and, show, and uh, show that they're members of ILSI, but all the rest of these are, are not visible to the public. And the same with this case with the EU pledge. Three comp companies register on the, the transparency register with EU pledge, uh, whereas more than 20 companies are members of it, and again, not visible to the public. Right, so, implications for policy, very quickly. There are multiple voices and points of access to the policy system, including indirect routes for corporations. Policymakers are often misled about the interest behind the group. They don't know, they're lied to, 
they are uh, naive sometimes. Partnership governance and self-regulation should be replaced with public health measures, uh, which is binding. The need for policymakers to ensure a level playing field for access to the different interests. The need to recognise advertising, marketing, media industry as a powerful actor uh, against public health, and just like any other addiction-related industries. The case for managing the role of alcohol, food and gambling, uh, as we have with tobacco, as Martine said, and I agree with that. We need to, to join up ethics and transparency rules again across governance levels. There are no rules to stop people from the national level taking jobs at the transnational level. There's just no rules. There's only rules about changes at the, the transnational level. And then to heighten transparency and conflict of interest rules so that public civil society and policymakers can be better informed on corporate strategy. That's me. Thank you. I know David ran over a couple of minutes, but I didn't dare stop him in case it was thought I was in the pay of uh, <laughs> industry. <laughs> yes, please. A, a couple of questions. And what's always amazing to me is how much of this information is publicly available on websites because they're appealing to their shareholders. So to them, this is an advertisement of how well they're doing. Really? It's just mm -hmm. ironic. Um, but uh, first, first, uh, Stan Glantz and I at UCSF have been looking at, the, at these issues in the tobacco archive mm -hmm. and also adding in food industry documents and um, have, on a qualitative level, are uncovering all sorts of similar things and looking historically. And one of the um, really important findings is that the uh, tobacco industry has been um, eyeballing uh, cannabis since the 1970s, and the reason that they haven't in it tried to integrate um, up until now uh, with blunts and things is because it was an illegal drug and they didn't want to be have their public image tainted by um, cannabis, so uh, an illegal drug. So yeah. now I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the legalization situation going on. And then... Um, uh, I had a second, oh, I was interested in what your thoughts are on the Coca-Cola transparency campaign and what the logic is behind that, which has on the one hand, for people who aren't aware, Coca-Cola, um, it was about four or five months ago after a, a lot of pressure from uh, an exercise outfit, CrossFit, they were being sued uh, by, in, in a lawsuit, decided to list everybody on a website that they give money to, individuals as well as institutions, and the NIH was on there, the CDC was on there, <laughs> pretty much everybody you know was on there. Um, and it's a database and you can scan through it. And so I'd be interested in what your thoughts are on the strategy behind that. Now some people have stepped down, University of Colorado gave money back, um, but what, what would what would be behind that kind of a, an, an approach to the situation? Why would uh, is Why it did Coca -Cola under do the it? gun? Or, uh, yeah, I mean, their consumption's down by 25%, so maybe that's it? They're just scared? What's up? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the tobacco industry, if it gets into cannabis, will want to pursue its strategies in, in relation to policymakers in the same way as it currently does. And, uh, and you know, so that, that's what would happen there. And, and if you're concerned about public health, then you have to, to recognise that, so that's the, the that's the payoff. No, not not there. No, I mean the the e-cigarettes e thing is becoming connected. You can see it in the more detailed data the connections that they have. To, I mean, connected strongly to the tobacco cluster, but on the the outside of that, on Coca-Cola. I mean, I mean, you know, sometimes corporations feel that they have to to open up on, if they're under pressure. And, you know, for, for a long time, Exxon listed all the. Uh, uh, social aspects of organisations that it funded, you know, especially in relation to climate, and then it withdrew from, it said, from funding climate denial work, didn't really do that. So that, that's part of that process. I, I guess that you're, I didn't know about this, but I guess that you're saying that Coca-Cola's uh, funding in the UK and the EU is not on the, the list. It's not. It's not on the list. They're, they don't list who they... No, it's international. Oh, it's international? Yeah, I mean, the list is so long, it will take you an hour. Right. To the, I'll be doing that tonight then. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You just Google transparency on the okay. Coca-Cola website. It's all and did they say say how, how much? Monitor from heaven. How much? Did they say how much? Yes. How they much do. What the name of the project was? Right. You can't search it. Uh, it's very carefully set up, so you can't yeah. search it by name of organization. Yeah. But if you're willing to sit there for hours and hours and, and look through it, uh, you can find the NIH. Well, 
Yeah, okay. So okay, that's really helpful. Which will, which Laura, you've done, you've done his research of the world <laughs> of good. Uh, so I think we'll, what I'll do now, actually, is bring the three speakers up, if they can perch neatly uh, around the microphone, so we can, we can begin to widen the, uh, the discussion. Uh, David, the, the Coca-Cola and um, uh, the brewers and uh, McDonald's and so on buying FIFA, is that a... Is that a common model? So sort of organisations like, I know FIFA has got a bad name now anyway, but do they buy apparently um, uh, sporting organisations like FIFA, like the World Athletic Federation? You best to answer that question, right? So, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, well, of course they do. I mean, uh, they spent lots of money on that. Martina had a slide on on celebrities and all mm. that kind of thing. That's a huge part of their uh, their effort to suggest that their products are healthy in some kind of way, which of course they're not. So yes. Martin, you had a question or a point. It was a comment just just to illustrate what David's talking about in action. As we're sitting here, um, I received an email from Pagefield. A community, I've just Googled them. They're a communications agency specialising in reputation management, campaigning and public affairs, inviting colleagues at our team in Stirling to meet Philip Morris's scientific engagement team, who will soon be visiting London for a series of briefing meetings with members of the academic community to discuss harm reduction and reduced risk products. As we're sitting yeah, that's here. Very, that's very good of them, isn't it, Philip Morris? We, we, we're touched. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, sorry. Hello, I'm Matilda. Uh, this is a question for all of you, or just thoughts that I want you to comment on, or, or would like to hear your comments on. I'm thinking about, uh, have you considered, I missed a bit of Martin's talk, so you might have mentioned this, but the ways in which, the new ways of marketing and profiling people, and big data, and how you're actually will transform marketing and transform everything we know about lifestyles, how you deal with them and how people make choices in everyday life uh, with the help of billions of uh, factor analysis and algorithmics. People will know before I know myself what I'm going to go to the, you know, and pick up and eat something or something. How, what, uh, we have a law, I can mention that in Finland we have a unique, globally unique new alcohol marketing law where it's forbidden to, uh, do, uh, to use uh, users of social media to uh, advertise uh, alcohol uh, as private citizens shouldn't be used for uh, advertising uh, alcohol. But do you have any, any ideas of what way should research go now to deal with this huge, you know, if it's coming, but it's coming because mm -hmm. they already know you Google something and then you will get in your flow some sort of commercial. They know everything about you already. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're right, it's hugely powerful and it's transformed marketing, not just because companies can now gather all that data on you and produce very tailored offerings for you individually based on your, your likes and your favourites and the favourite celebs and your consumption patterns and so on. But also because users themselves then become, as you say, part of the marketing and marketing messages that are passed on by ordinary people have much more power and authenticity than marketing messages which seem to come from companies. And we've seen major deals between Diageo and Facebook and, and other, there's a YouTube and Heineken, I think, as well. So major, major deals there, which, which if you read how the companies themselves talk about that, are all about capturing that data and being part of the conversation. But, I mean, there are things we can do. I mean, tobacco companies are not allowed to have a presence on uh, social media in the EU. Why can we not do the same for alcohol? It could be done if the will was there. I, I t told my wife not to use her Tesco's loyalty card when <laughs> buying wine. I do not <laughs> want Tesco's to know what I drink. Uh, any, any other comments on this issue? Uh, well, in general, um, I think if you look at, at different generations of people that are, that are using alcohol, uh, you see the same pattern in the sense that the, the, all these generations like to drink. But uh, at the same time, you also see uh, differences in uh, which drinks are actually fashionable. 
And uh, in, in younger generations today, I see drinks coming up that are not heavily marketed, but they are very popular. So one way or another, uh, these do, how do you become, how do I become popular is not really clear to me. Perhaps it's <clears> just a snowball effect of youngsters that are telling each other, perhaps even via, via Facebook and social media, but it's not necessarily marketing that, plays, uh, that, that drives these, these changes in fashion, just as uh, think changes in fashion uh, uh, of, of clothes you know, are not necessarily driven by marketing on television or, or radio or whatever. So there are other uh, players in there that, that uh, yeah, are important that we haven't act actually looked at. Sometimes those conversations, sometimes those apparently user-generated conversations are seeded by producers and advertising agencies and so on. And also the scale, to, the scale of to this, tell what's genuine. the okay. scale of this is huge, but we shouldn't be surprised, should we? I mean, that's what uh, companies need to, to do. I mean, should we, should we be more cross with governments for being hoodwinked or being complicit often? Is that a question? <laughs> it's a, it's, it's well, I mean, obviously, it's, it's governments that can do things about it. So governments can do things about the marketing practices which target um, young people or older people and, and how, how that operates and what Martine's looking at. But the, uh, governments can also do stuff about regulating the, the policy decision processes whereby uh, decisions come to be decided and they can democratise those or they can decide to, to leave them in the kind of current commercialised state that mm. they're in. And that, you know, that's a matter of political will and mm. a matter of pressure from, from below and from us and other people like that. It's a, it's a question of pressure. I mean, number 10 Downing Street was surprised when we were concerned that the new chief executive of the whole civil service in Westminster was remaining on the board of SAB Miller. They couldn't see why we thought there might be a conflict. Yeah. Peter. I mean, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm really following your point, Ian. I mean, this, this sort of corporate capture of policy, I mean, I mean it's not... You've illustrated it fantastically, David, in the, in the topic area that we work on. But, of course, that's, that's just across everything. Um, and it's a much more kind of fundamental issue. You know, is that the way we want to structure our societies, yes or no? Um, and, and, the, and the problem is, I think, is that at the government level, people have a different language and a different level of understanding. And, and many people in the government level would accept that this is, nor this is normal. This is how it works. And... Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, you've just given an anecdote of how they perceive that as normal. So it would require, I mean, yes, great more transparency, but that's not really going to do anything, is it? Um, one would, if we thought this was an issue, it would require much more fundamental structure in the whole way we organise politics. Well, it would, but. Um there is a recognition, though, that it's an issue. That, you know, David Cameron said before he was elected to, to, as Prime Minister that uh, lobbying was the next big issue waiting to happen and there had to have be transparency. They were, when they got into to, to, to power, they were the coalition, they said that they would have a lobbying register in Britain, and we now have a lobbying register in Britain. And crap it is too. But, <laughs> but they, they recognise these are issues. They, it's not that they, they, they've, they live in some kind of parallel neoliberal universe where they can't see what the issues are. They, they can see what the issues are. Plus, there are, there are people in the decision-making bureaucracies who, who aren't totally uh, taken over by neoliberal ideologies, who, are, who don't believe in that inequality is the best way forward. And they, they are people who, who can be helped, and, and they need to be um, properly informed. And, you know, the, the key uh, question about sort of the, the decision-makers is not whether they're going to be hostile to what we say, but that whether they're going to have any idea about some of the things that we're saying. And actually, quite a lot of them don't have any idea. And when they do, mm -hmm. when you speak to people in ministries of uh, health or in the commission or whatever, and you tell them some of the stuff, some of them are quite shocked. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they can t overturn the EU's neoliberalising mission, but there are ways to work on that. It doesn't, it doesn't have to require revolution tomorrow. Although, you know, maybe that's the maybe way... Maybe revolution, work. maybe do it more slowly. Laura, you're going to, to make us feel... Just You're going to, to make follow. us feel better, Laura, by telling us it's not Actually, nearly as bad a, in the United States. There's a second way uh, to do this, which is through the corporations and shareholders. So corp there's nothing in corporate law, international, or at least my understanding, the U.S., that says that corporations have to 
um, maximize shareholder value. That's the ideology currently in the free market world, and that's what corporations can and sometimes do. But as long as a corporate CEO and board tells the shareholders what it's going to do, they can do whatever they want, right? And so corporations have a choice. It, whether they want to rape the population of its, you know, health, or they they want to, you know, they can, and and so there's, it's not like industry is one monolithic uh, beast. There's a plenty of there are many shades of gray there, and so there's plenty of room for within the the corporate sector for shareholders for okay. citizens and so forth to hold those ca uh, companies mm -hmm. accountable and to say, you know what, it, it isn't all about profit maximization. So that's a second avenue other than going through the political. Yeah, I mean, it takes us back to Noel Olson, the iconic figure you know, who uh, used to buy one share in a tobacco company then go to the, go to the AGM exactly. each the year <laughs> and uh, he sadly died last, last year. Just a last quick comment from Patricia. Maybe this is what Peter was referring to, but it would be helpful to have more content, like to, to go beyond this, like some case studies. I mean, last time you spoke at one of our meetings, you you did present a really interesting case study, and um, you know, some of my experiences in the UK around trying to get prevention going, you know, followed, drink aware, diage, all of that, but case studies on how these pathways actually play themselves out uh, is. And no, put it on, on yeah, that's put it on point. the I think we show the public. I, I think we rushed David a bit, so he didn't have time to show the individual um, anecdotes. Yeah, but. and we have, we have got, I mean, the, the, the network provides us with um, a rationale for saying, these are the important places to look. And then you say, well, okay, so we've got the important places, the important nodes, let's go and have a look at those nodes. And that's what we do in, uh, in, in the, the, the bigger work. And uh, look at the way in which the, the different organisations operate together and what happens as a result, you know, what, what happens as, as a result yeah. of, in particular case studies, well, we've got a case study on, for example, on, on marketing to children and the attempt to sabotage Martinez's work, actually, uh, and others, uh, and the way in which academics are then used in that. And we've done that through using FOI documents and uh, uh, various other techniques and, uh, as well. So, that, of course, that has to, that you have to give the colour once you've understood what the backbone is and you can see where the different parts are and then look at in more detail. Yes, of course. Yeah. It will be online, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a... So that it's available. If I'm yep. a politician, I'd like to sure. know who I'm talking to. Sure. And that point about anecdotes is really important. Last time I went to the Department of Health with a whole lot of evidence, they said, oh, well, that's all very well, but can you give us a few anecdotes to tell the ministers? That's all that they understand. I'm afraid I'm going to... Oh, one, one, one. Just so small, so quick. So, so small. It's just that I, I guess this work was done on a European Union scale. Uh, is there such a work on a country by country level or, or could you help spread the methods to have this work done on a country by country level? Sure, I mean it could be, it could be I mean we, we have got case studies of, um, of the Netherlands, Italy and the UK as part of the work which I didn't mention today. But yeah, of course you could do that. I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 you mentioned, Matilda, the whole question of big data. This is a big data study, but put together from publicly accessible other, other forms of data, which, where you, you bring them together and you harmonize the, the data. There are all sorts of ways in which the transparency registers available at the EU level or at national level or in the US can be brought together. And we, really what we need to do is to bring together the, the data on corporate affiliations with co the data on, on political party funding and to bring it together with the stuff in the US because these are all the same corporations, right? To, and to, there's tons of data we can bring together. It's a huge job to do that, but you can do that. And that would start to tell you lots more stuff that we don't know yet. Okay, well, thank you very much. It will all be all right if Donald Trump gets in. So um, is that right? Maybe not. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really, uh, really, really lively. Uh